topics uh, to discuss today. So yeah, go ahead, Andy, let's start. We are recording. Watch your language, me. <laughs> So um, let, I'll start the introduction. I'm Carl Dickens, president of La Cienega Valley Association. I've done that for, I think now 16 years. Um, and I'm not sure why, anyway. Uh, and the other thing, the co-chair of the Santa Fe Rivers Traditional Communities Collaborative at, at Felicity I've done now, I think this is our eighth year that oh, we've been doing yeah. this. Um, yeah. And I'm really proud of the collaborative because in terms of Water knowledge, I don't think there's a group that has more um, knowledge and understanding of, of water issues uh, in the Santa Fe watershed. So that's me. And I'm Felicity Brennan, uh, former director of the Santa Fe Watershed Association and co-chair of this group. And um, yeah, continues to be challenging, but rewarding. Good to see everybody. Thank you for being here. Carrie, you want to go next? Uh, Carrie Olson, Santa Fe County. I'm the Santa Fe River Project Manager. Um, so working on the Greenway Trail and I'm um, happy to just listen in today and hear about some of the water issues. Um, <clears throat> good morning, everyone. I'm Santa Fe County Commissioner Anna Hansen. Um, I also sit on the Santa Fe, uh, the City of Santa Fe River Commission. Uh, so I have a dual purpose here um, and I care and love the river. David. Dave Grenfeld, former, former president of the Santa Fe Watershed Association and a director of the Water Culture Institute, which is my own little creation to bring a, a perspective of ethics into our legally framed water awareness. Fascinating, it really is. How about Christine? Morning everyone, Christine Chavez and I manage the city's water conservation program. And I've worked with most of you and, and some I'm seeing in person for the first time. And so it's nice to connect a name with the face and really happy to be here today, thanks. Bill from behind the screen. Good morning, uh, Bill Schneider, manage the water resources for the city of Santa Fe and also a strong supporter of uh, a balanced river system. Thank you. Andrew. Uh, I'm Andrew Erdman and uh, I work also for the city over in the water conservation office. Patricio. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. My name is Patricio Pacheco. I'm also uh, part of the water division. I work with the water resource conservation group, water resource analyst. Trisha, you want to go one more time? So we've had some people join. Sure. Uh, Trisha Snyder here. I am brand new with Wild Earth Guardians, uh, starting as the Rio Grande campaigner. Are you from around here or did they, did, are you new to the area? I'm originally from uh, El Paso area, spent a lot of time in Southern New Mexico, uh, got my undergrad at NMSU, and, uh, but I'm currently living in Ellensburg, Washington. I moved up here for grad school and I'll be relocating to Albuquerque in about a, a couple months. Wow, fantastic, great, yeah. good, you good. Jen, you wanna chime in real quick? Sure. I'm Jen Pels. I'm the Wild Rivers Program Director at Guardians. Um, I grew up in Santa Fe. Maybe people don't maybe don't know that, but I did. <laughs> I love New Mexico. Um, I actually live in Colorado now. It's fine, but <laughs> someday I will get back. <laughs> <laughs> I have to get my kids off to college, I think, first. But um, so anyway, I love being a part of this group. Um, thanks, Andy, for inviting me. And um, you may see one or we probably won't both be at these meetings, but um, I wanted to bring Tisha today so that she could meet all of you and, um, and we like being involved. So thanks so much for including us. Excellent. Thanks for being here. Dr. Lindlein. Hey there. Good morning. <laughs> Hi gang. Thank you. I, my name is Jennifer Lindlein. I'm a geology professor at New Mexico Highlands University and oversee the water resources program. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate being part of this group and staying informed and being involved. Thank you. Thanks for being here. And William, 
Is that you? We weren't expecting you. I'm so happy you're here. Um, I don't know how long I'll stay, but uh, William Me, Agua Fria Village. Question at Agua Fria Village, the Asaki Association, what a, and the his, local historian. Yeah, keep what, her You want to learn about Santa Fe, you talk to William. Any aspect. <laughs> it, true. And he's the mayor of Agua Fria. <laughs> he should be. Yeah. Well, he's the president of the Village Association, so yeah. we can call him Ma Mr. President. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hi, Bobby. Good morning. We're just getting through introductions. Oh, good. Let us I know who you are. Oh, I, <laughs> I am Bobby Basold. I work with um, Rivers Run Through Us and Global Warming Express. I'm on the board of Global Warming Express, Global We. And I'm an artist and activist, educator. That's it. Glad to be here. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Got it, everybody? Yep. Well, I'll throw in. I'm Andy Otto, Executive Director of the Santa Fe Watershed Association. And I'm here with my two mentors, David Grenfell and Felicity Brennan. Thank you. Nice compliment. So the first topic, the first agenda item is the county city water planning process. And Angelie Bean, who is the county representative who's working with Jesse Roach from the city, uh, has budget meetings this morning. She was hoping she could join us, but she isn't able to. Um, and I, I, this is just an observation that I want to kind of open it up for discussion. Um, but I participated in the, in the initial um, planning sessions kind of organizational se sessions. And one of the things that kind of surprised me is how few people were participating. And so that's one of the things I hope looking down the road that we can get more people involved and more people from the collaborative involved in terms of, of looking at that joint county city planning, because I think it's so important. William, why don't you give us your observations? You, you attended those sessions as well, right? Uh, yes. Um... Gosh, uh, it was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, you know, I'm, I was just glad that uh, the city and the county were really serious about this effort. Um, because I, I kind of wondered, you know, we had those uh, meetings at the old College of Santa Fe. And, you know, so many people that I saw there, um, when, in, I guess, 2019, or was it early 20? Right. Um, you know, they were saying, ah, oh, well, the city says a, a pretty thing, but, you know, are they going to really commit to, to, you know, having a good inclusive process? And, you know, a lot of the lower river folks were kind of upset, you know, I mean, uh, and some of the environmentalists were very upset because, you know, they just didn't feel that that uh, pipeline as a, a foregone conclusion was the right thing to do. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that the city county effort is now uh, being addressed very seriously. I have something to add to that. I was at the meetings as well, and um, including the ones at the College of Santa Fe. Um, and I guess I'll start there since that's in the past, but those were, um, uh, those were really a show for me. That's how I took it. Um, it was great to be at a round table with people and, um, and to feel and to meet new people in that process. But um, our comments were written in pencil on a piece of paper and I asked what was going to what was going to happen to that to those oh and we'll collect them and I, I, you know like reading people reading people's handwriting and things like that um, anyway so that I I felt like that was a performance event that we attended it was an entertainment thing to really present the pipeline and um, and as far as the um, the other ones went have gone, I feel um, yeah like there were too few people there, um, but uh, there was a 
a, a bit of a better engagement process with everyone who was there. Um, but it was still, um, for example, there were only five people at one of the, uh, the first meeting I went to. And, um, and I had about five questions and I was only allowed to um, put forward one question. Um, the other people who were in that meeting uh, had, um, you know, there were only like three things addressed there. So I, I don't know, you know, I understand that, that that's a kind of a, um, the process was, uh, they were trying to be fair to everybody, but there was enough time to address all of those questions that I had. And um, so I don't, I don't, you know, it's tricky, but um, in terms of how to get more people involved in those things. Um, I don't think the city is great with their outreach. Um, uh, they, you know, there's got to be the, you know, to start with what, with the graphics and how things look um, and how people, how things are presented. It's often difficult to um, get right into what the issue, you know, what the thing is um, with what's presented to people. Um, and um, it can be kind of fuzzy. And, and also I believe that the, the graphics are really terrible and the images that are used are really terrible. And I think that's important. It may not seem important, but um, it does help to get people involved if things look like I don't know, you know, that this is an exciting process and there's a way to present that with, um, with images. And, um, but I don't know, you know, I don't know, you know, we got, we got the, we got a result, the results of the, um, um, everybody's uh, feedback um, who filled out the, um, the, um, you know, what our thoughts were about what was most important and, you know, things like that. And the lower river was at the very bottom of everybody's, um, um, everybody's, everybody who participated in that. In terms of importance, it was the, it was the least important. And, and that says to me that people have no idea about what's going on there. And they don't, that ju they just don't know that there's not enough of a, of um, um, inform not information is, it's quite not the right word. It's like, um, um, there's, again, there's this, the city doesn't provide provocative, interesting, inf great images that show what's going on down river. There, there's no story sharing. There's no, you know, there's a lack of that. I, um, Bobby, I, I'm going to cut you off. I think if, you, if we want lots of people to get engaged and involved, I think that's a way to do it. I'll stop. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Bobby, because I think we that's the piece we need to really focus on is the results of what was collected and the information there. And when I saw that chart, I, I did, does everybody know what we're talking about? That was sent out. Andy sent that out, right, to everybody. Right. Um, revealing the results of that survey and how that like the the it, it barely registered when people said you know importance of the lower santa fe river there was like this tiny little squiggle of a line and and i found that fascinating and troubling and i think that that's again a role that we can assist with if yep. um because really it's what it said to me is that people don't understand how important a river system is for its own sake that that and that there of course there's a, their priority is long-term resilience and supply of course of course i mean I, I think any of us would answer that and it demonstrated that there was just this chasm of um uh, a dearth of knowledge in that department and so i think that that's another place that this group can step in and look at that as an opportunity and anna i saw that your hand was up yes yeah, thank you um so i um 
I think one of the, uh, speaking from the county side, which is where the lower river is, yeah. is that I think the commission has actually really started to push that, you know, our utility, John Dupuy and Anjali be more engaged because the city is not in charge of the river downstream. They're only in charge, you know, even yeah, though yeah. the river doesn't really know the boundaries, you know, it is a good sign that Carrie is here at this meeting. Yeah. Um, John Dupuy needs to be, you know, uh, engaged also, and which he has been more and more, and so has Anjali since this meeting happened. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I represent the village of Agua Fria, so I am pretty vocal about. Uh, <laughs> Yay! <laughs> thank you, William, about what uh, I want to see happen there and, you know, my effort to protect that. And so it takes, um, it takes the commission also pushing uh, staff from the dais to get more involved. And one of the more unfortunate things is we have not been able to hire a hydrologist since Jerry left. And, you know, Jerry used to participate in all of these meetings and losing him to the state was um, a loss for the county. But, you know, we were lucky to have him the length of time we did since he left, uh, he came to the county after the end of the Richardson administration. And then we had him all through the Martinez administration at the county. And so he's at the state now back. So, but we have a good staff on our utility team, but it's engaging them and also engaging, you know, our new watershed coordinator and making sure that when these meetings happen that, um, our voices are heard, you know? And from what I heard just now is there was very few people at these meetings. So how, would you, how could you expect the um, downstream users to have a voice when we had very few people at this meeting? So uh, I agree with uh, Carl and William and everybody, more participation needs to happen. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to um, uh, piggyback on what the commissioner said about Jerry. And, you know, he was a tremendous uh, member of this group. And a, a fascinating thing that happened is he and Andrew Erdman um, were just so um, dynamic together. And so I wanted to put in a plug for Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to comment on John Dupuy and Angeli Bean because I've had some um, interactions with them. And I, I got to tell you, uh, having been at this for a while, um, I don't think I've ever felt more comfortable, confident, um, I really feel like they're engaged in understanding what's going on and with a real willingness to listen and understand, I mean, it's one of those things we, we have, you know, some serious water issues in La Cienega, obviously, um, but it became readily apparent to me that they really understood. And they're looking at ways to try and help us, whether it's the El Dorado Wells, whether it's um, the river flow. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that they, they I think, can contribute to. And obviously, the overriding thing for us is the, the La Cienega watershed conditions and how we can get those implemented over time which would help to restore the springs of La Cienega, which would help the river health, um, help the, the river and, and provide flows to our friends down in La Bajada. Welcome aboard, Darren. Are you in town? Good to see you. Yes, Darren I'm Munzer. I'm home. Good morning. Yeah, so I'm, I'm home in La Bajada right now. Okay. Darren is the president of the La Bajada Village Association. No, no, I'm the chairman of the traditional village committee uh, and a, a commissioner on the La Bajada Community Ditch and the Mutual Domestic Water Association. But let's go back to, to the, the concept of county um, city water planning. Uh, I think it's something as a group that we've supported 
um, over and over again. So any attempt to, to begin this process to have the entities, because, you know, obviously we're in the county, so the city makes decisions and we don't have a say in it. And so to, to be able to see the beginnings of this, a process where the county and city seriously sit down and start talking about water is something that we're certainly going to, uh, from our community's perspective, is going we're going to support. Which leads me to the, the, the concept of a regional water authority and whether or not that makes sense. And I think it does. Um, and it's one of those things that if it's, if it's constructed carefully, it could be a real benefit. I mean, it's one of those things where it's, it's, it can't be political. Go ahead, Ina. So the biggest problem and obstacle to doing that and even discussing it is a resolution that Joe Maestas brought forward in 2017 in front of the city council that stated that the city will not engage in regional water uh, planning authority with the county except for on BDD. So in order to make any headway with that, that resolution has to be rescinded. I would say that your best hope on that is uh, uh, Councillor Romero Worth and um, and possibly uh, Councillor uh, Councilwoman Renee Villarreal. Yep. Um, and building up support and explaining why that resolution needs to be rescinded. And that is the first thing that has to happen because without rescinding that resolution, they're not gonna talk to you. And, you know, I find that unfortunate. The, count, the commission in 2017 brought forward at a, the only joint meeting that we have had with the city council since I have been elected in 2017. We brought that up and immediately Councillor Maestas went to the city council and brought forward this resolution to never discuss regional planning on water. So that is, that is a huge problem. And until that resolution is rescinded at the city, you know, uh, they're not going to talk to you. I, I mean, I'm just being truthful. So um, thank you. Andy. Oh, Andy. super. Thanks. Uh, to me, a couple of things in there. I think it goes back to something that um, ha ha we've always said for the last number of years is, is we need to to show the city that there's value in a regional water authority and uh, for the city. Um, and so that's part of the challenge that we have uh, to, to, is to explain that. The second thing is that, that there's some pretty big headway that happened with the share pool agreement that the county and city have just gone through. That's showing the city that there's some value with including the city in their water planning. And it, of course, also shows the county that there's some value to including the city in their water planning. So I think those may be some of the first steps to, um, to maybe kind of start with. Aaron, then and, David. Uh, uh, just, in a, just to interject before. So that's why, you know, the pool agreement has to do with BDD. So if we can continue to, um, use the BDD as an example of how, you know, regional water planning can work and to benefit not only uh, the city, but, you know, the county, then we have a better chance. I have also just recently been elected as a BDD chair. So I am gonna continue to work on these issues. Erin? Well, good morning again. And Good morning, Commissioner Hanson. And I, I, I'm super excited about the possibilities that present themselves now, looking at today's situation in comparison with say 2011 and, and where we were at in 2011. And so actually I need to get my bearings here. Commissioner Hanson, that's right, we're 
I guess you saw a city resolution come out in 2017. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm trying to remember. I think it was around 2011. The county was already talking about a regional water plan. Correct? That's before her time. <laughs> okay, well, I think it may have been as early as 2007. And about 2011, it got to a point where they were doing a countywide canvas of available water rights and, and uh, uh, to figure out what the county might have as paper water in addition to uh, what, what real water rights were there to actually manage in a regional management plan. And that's when the ideas of supplemental wells came up uh, uh, to, to substitute or, or uh, uh, eliminate our surface water right on the Santa Fe River. Nice. So what, what's really exciting to me now is what I see is a distinctly different tone coming from the city, where, where now we're not talking about what used to be their excuse of anything coming out of that uh, Pase Real plant is uh, artificial water and is their property, you know? Now there's at least a consciousness of returning flow to the river and getting return flow credits to the Rio Grande Basin or whatever. But the, the, the main point being that the, the difference in perception from the city has come a long way since 2011. So I, I think, yes, it's time to exploit that and it's time to exploit whatever uh, positive relationship is going on between the city and the county. And if they're starting to understand each other, and we're starting to get this on a regional level of understanding, then great. But it's a matter, as Commissioner Hansen says, of getting a hold of political will in Santa Fe and having them uh, be uh, main, you know, willing to maintain uh, a working relationship with the smaller communities, the traditional communities downriver, the Secas, other interested stakeholders, you know, private landowners, what have you. But at least now there's some commonality between the city and the county thinking so i think that's where this collaborative is supposed to step in and and uh, on our primary uh, mission was to ensure sustainable flow in that river be that from ala fria all the way down or from the reservoir all the way down well okay fine you want to consider santa fe a traditional community too then they have a right to a flowing river too so uh, anyway it's a, a much different time so there's progress here to be made so um anyway glad to be home Thanks for inviting me this morning, but that's what I see as an opportunity there. So thanks for bringing that up, Commissioner Hansen. Let's figure David, out what we're going to do about David, that. you're going to be next. I want to recognize our youngest member who just joined us. This is uh, William's grandson. Um, and what's his name? You're on mute. William, you're on mute. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, this is River. Say hello, River. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what a great name. <laughs> Perfect timing. Welcome to our um, uh, collaborative. Welcome, River. Okay, David, you had a comment. River automatically becomes a member of the group with that name. But yeah, I, I, I wasn't, I, I wasn't um, thinking much. It's hard about to that. hear you, David. Wait, okay. I think it's soft voice, okay. Um, I wasn't thinking that much about the fact that, that there's a, a, bar, uh, uh, a mug, uh, what do you call it, when a, a mugging order. You can't speak about the regional water plan, uh, regional water authority. That, that goes, that can't stand for, it just goes against all logic. Uh, and the, God, yes. the whole thrust of modern water management is you need to look, have a whole basin approach. And if that's too big, then you, you divide it up a little bit, but you, you try to, to encompass as much as you can. And to cut- uh, uh, David, it's still very hard to hear you. Okay, uh, go ahead and I'll come back after I put my head back on. Well, I think we're all supportive of, of the idea. And I would ask our friends at the city to look at, at that um, thing, my Estes, was it, it was just a proclamation. I'm not sure what the title is for it. Um, but if we could look at that and start talking about uh, rescinding it, just doesn't make any sense at this point. 
So okay. Andrew and William, is that Wait, something? Can I can I say what I wanted to say? Can you hear me now? Sure. Yes, yeah. yes, definitely. Yeah. Okay. Um, no, but I think the the um, the constituency that's that's being left out that should be weighing in on this are the environmental groups. I mean, Wild Earth Guardians is here, but that's that's great. But Sierra Club and Audubon and they're focusing on the Rio Grande. But there's I think they could be pulled into also um, weigh in on regional water issues that an authority leave the authority you know to the sideline i don't you know but i really talk about what are some regional issues that need to be discussed at a larger level than the city or the county um, and to me what's missing from the water plan in santa fe and the reason i started the water culture institute 10 years ago is that the environment is just seen as as a, a resource for human rights to water. And the, the whole shifting of now that we have a Biden administration and we're re-entering global discussions about climate change, we have a lot of catching up to do. And the, the, the way climate is going to affect our water sources um, and is already is, is through the natural ecosystems. So our goal for a regional water plan seems to me could be to, to protect our regional water ecosystem and then talk about how to divide that up. But, but the environmental groups have an interest and an important voice to articulate why you know, the basic you know, environmentalism 101 that nature and people are linked, whether we like to recognize that or not. And the Buckman diversion can't divert if there's no water in the, in the Rio Grande Basin. So our, our orientation ought to be, how can we strengthen the, our natural ecosystems of the Rio Grande and the Santa Fe River and the aquifers and, and come up with creative ideas for doing that, including a, a basin authority, not just a regional authority, but mm -hmm. Santa Fe should and Albuquerque should be playing a, a regional role in helping to manage the river for our own future benefit. So I, I think that 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 little thing of putting a restraining order on discussing something that's so logical as a regional water authority or regional water issues would be a good way to bring to enlarge the constituency discussing the overall regional water plan. Thank you. Jenny, you have a comment? Okay, so uh, William has suggested via chat that we write a letter and I think that's a good idea as a start. So I think Felicity and I can put a letter together just about that <clears throat> to rescind that um, motion or whatever it was that, that uh, my Estes did so it was a resolution it was done in 2017 around um I was going to say May or June I don't know the number of the resolution city staff I'm sure will know I, I see Andrew have, has his hand up yeah it's 2017-50 and <laughs> as many of you will find if you go and open that link it includes a large memo that I wrote um, so um, it is not the resolution itself, which is exactly as Councillor Hanton explained it, but just because my name's on there and I feel like I should at least mention it before you get there so it doesn't feel like scandalous, but <laughs> yeah. Well, um, Andrew, is it, do you think that it's possible to bring that resolution back up and, and create a scandal that this is no longer relevant and that this is a scandalous resolution and we shouldn't, um, that we, we could, I mean, do you think that that has any teeth to it? I mean, not really. I, I think you can definitely always discuss, right, these kind of resolutions and the city's position, and that's really what the council is there to do. Um, and I don't think changing position is necessarily particularly all that scandalous either. I mean, that's why they continue to meet. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that seems really appropriate to me uh, as a way yeah. to, to mention that you have a specific thing that you'd like addressed. and. Um, bring it up. I, mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm 
me. I've got like all sorts of people who I work for watching quietly in the wings while I say this, but I hope that I, I think that's <laughs> a way to uh, go about doing it. I think that's a reasonable approach. Yeah. Okay. Can I tie this back to, to what David was mentioning? Cause it does spark a comment is that maybe what we're looking at is a, a regional water plan. Again, we're revisiting that idea as opposed to the development of a regional water authority. No, this okay. is where this is where the hair on the back of my acequia parciante neck goes up when I hear about a centralized regional water authority that's going to degrade the autonomy of the of the acequia uh, resources number one, but culture number two, right? And and so that's something that that we have to consider. I think very early on now, while we're just developing language for even what we're talking about. Maybe that's what we need to do to look at getting people enthused about participating in it because they're not surrendering to a regional authority as much as they are having their voice amplified in a regional plan and making sure that their, their interest is identified, not just on a commodity level, not just on a resource level with water, but like you say, for the more unquantifiable things. Uh, like uh, uh, cultural heritage and uh, uh, historical significance and uh, you know uh, then we get back into of course the idea of what we're talking about with the sacred nature of water that's an entirely you know it's part of this it's part of this discussion I think that's what we've had over the years is there really has been whether anybody likes it or not some education just by osmosis forgive the pun huh but but people are starting to get an idea of it and I think Maybe the role that David brings up of environmental groups is with the lesson that we've learned, if, we, if we're going to be uh, honest about it in our self-assessment and continuing improvement, is that our first run at having environmentalists petition for federal dollars to work on modifying or changing the environment did not work. That's a, it's not worked out well. It's resulting in a, in a uh, uh, it's working counter to what our stated goal is, is, is to keep on with as much natural flow in that river as we can keep on with not impoundment and holding and and you know environmental by products that that have given us all concern with water quality issues and all this other distraction to keep that flowing and and use the position run now by making a plan for the future instead of just reacting to that then we have to go back to to uh, considering the basis of reclamation, resource management, and all of that in the territory of New Mexico and look back at the Hearst Doctrine from the Forest Service. And therein we find a good model for managing all these resources that we have that's particular to the northern New Mexico, central New Mexico, north central New Mexico environment that has a different watershed ecosystem than can be found from that maybe the Sierra Club is used to uh, being deeply involved in or whatever other environmental group. I mean, we've talked about this before where the unique nature of this watershed and human p participation and stewardship and intervention over the last uh, uh, centuries has developed a, a unique ecosystem here that, that going forward, yes, we need to consider our population part of, not at odds with. So, um, there's a lesson to be learned, I think, by looking back at some of that history from the Hearst Doctrine on back to our traditional Azteca cultures and, and use those as models first. So use this regional planning uh, tool as a place to build models first before we do more of the trial and error. You know, So I think to clearly define the role of environmental groups is important more as advisory, educational, uh, clearing houses, that type of thing. and. Uh, uh, good for documentation and studies um, so that we can we can look at but not I think it, we've got to be very careful not to uh, introduce competing agendas into into what this collaborative is supposed to be doing good point so yeah. let's see go ahead William I'm uh, Andrew um, yeah Darren I mean I think everything Darren just said is a great point and and also Darren's perspective I mean it's I think sometimes we tend to boil these things down so much that it feels like there's just two perspectives in the room and Darren, you've clearly got a third perspective that's different than either of those. So um, that really points to the importance of groups like this to hear those things. Um, and, you know, I just, I, I guess I just want to wrap up before we totally move off of the um, resolution, just a, a quick um, 
I don't know, explanation of kind of how it came to be where it was right there. That was, um, you know, Darren's also brought up this really long perspective starting back in 2007 or possibly sooner. So um, at the time that that resolution was passed, there was an earlier resolution that had been considered by this, by the, I guess it would have been the Public Utilities Commission Committee. Um, and uh, and the, the county was gonna pass the same resolution that was actually gonna create a series of meetings at that time. And then that actually turned out not to pass. And this was the sort of, uh, I don't know, the response, you know, kind of the opposite thing that ended up passing instead a month or two later. Um, so I only mentioned that because, you know, it kind of looks like, I mean, it is right now, like it's a, as the commissioner pointed out, it's, it's, a, it's an obstacle, but it's an obstacle that, we, that was encountered during the process of kind of moving towards um, having more discussion. So, I mean, I think, you know, things are kind of on track, like Darren says, over a long period of time, it's been moving towards having um, discussions. And then I just have one last thing and then I promise I'll stop talking here. Um, the last piece here is that like, when, and uh, there's like, there's a big difference where for someone like me who's listening to this sort of talking about regional planning and adding what Carl's done and kind of adding the word authority to it, that authority is like a very specific kind of term of art. And definitely for me, it makes me think of like the Albuquerque Bernalillo Water Ut uh, Utility Authority. Um, so it seems like those are almost two kind of different things to be talking about in the same, I don't know, Senate. So I just mentioned that that, you know, for me, that's kind of how I'm hearing that. I'm like, I think that's the intention, but I'm, I'm going to put I, it back on silent and be quiet. So. I agree with Andrew. I don't think we should use the word authority because it creates too many legal uh, blocks. You know, a regional water planning is really where we need to start at, you know, and uh, because this is going to require buy-in from both commissioners and counselors. How about a planning consortium? Consortium is always a great word. Yeah. It's a good one, though. No? It's Bobby. a really good one. Yeah. <laughs> Bobby has something to say. Um, we a uh, very important voice is missing, um, which is the are the pueblos and the tribal voices, the who, people who are have been um, dealing with water issues way longer than we have. So, um, and and I know it's um, we have had Kochati at our meetings before. Um, maybe more of a personal outreach to um, ensure that. Um, those folks are are part of this um, conversation, and can, especially can I, if we're creating a, a regional water thing, um, th they have to definitely be a part of that. Bobby, you remember J Jason Romero and Kaiti Blue Sky, right? They, they I, I used to see, see them at meetings, but like I say, not for maybe a year, a uh, year and a half, almost two, going on two years ago now. So who, who have we been seeing at meetings lately? Well, I, I want to let you know that I, uh, Jason actually contacted me about a month ago, um, right. and it had to do with the release um, and how that was all planned and, and uh, thought through. And so there is, uh, I think, another opportunity to connect with Cochiti. And you and I dare know that the Pueblo politics um, and the changes in leadership happens too frequently. Right. I don't know if everybody understands, but <clears throat> many of the Pueblos still use a clan system. They don't elect leaders. They have clans that meet and make decisions on who's going to um, run the, the Pueblo for the Next couple, sometimes it used to be just every year they change. But it changes administration every year, but the staff doesn't necessarily change among departments. That's why it's important to know, you know, previously, uh, like Jason worked for, for the uh, uh, Environmental Resources Conservation Department of the Pueblo, right? And then uh, Kaiti was working in wildlife biology particularly right down at the confluence there where there's, you know, there, there's been enhancement of marshland there. So perfect segue into our next agenda item. So Felicity and I work on a, a letter um, about a, a planning process a joint, and, and talking about the resolution, right? Well, yeah, let me and just get back for a second, just to, to yeah. answer what Bobby was saying is I'm 
at least trying to get a hold of, of both Jason and Kaiti and maybe Calvin Sweena, who's right here in Lavahala, to um, uh, kind of invite them into this conversation. So I just wanted Bobby to know that, that we're not completely right. silent on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. There's not effort. Um, there is effort being put into uh, uh, starting that conversation. So I'll keep you apprised if I hear anything from either of those three fellas. Felicity? Well, I was just going to bring it back to Andy and um, Andy's working on a planning process that is, and I wonder with other people, with other groups, and I just wonder if you could fill everybody in on that, because as we use the word planning, it makes me think that you're doing a plan and you've got partners with that. And how would we be different than that and that kind of thing? What are we asking for that's different than what you're creating or doing? Sure, uh, I'll throw in that because a bunch of the folks here have been involved. So uh, we got a, a grant from uh, Bureau of Reclamation to do the phase one portion, if you will, of a, of a watershed plan. And phase one involves doing the, getting the mapping together. So we've got a guy working on that. And it also involves getting stakeholder input now before there's a plan. And I've talked to, to Darren on this, and uh, of course, William and I have talked to, uh, and, uh, and everybody here, I think, is, is on the list, if you will, um, because the idea is we want to, we're having, we actually have a social scientist out of Utah State University to do the interviews um, so that she can try, and her name is Dr. Courtney Flint, and try to... Um, make these, put these together in a, in a uh, understandable, um, I'll say format. And that is starting up, I mean, we just got yesterday the word from Utah State that good to go. So we'll be starting that directly here. And um, that's the idea is that we're doing that now, this year, 2021. Um, the next step would be to apply for a WaterSmart grant phase two, if you will, which is to actually work on the plan. But first things first, we want to get the stakeholder input. That's number one. Go ahead, Dean. Go ahead, I, I think first things first, let's turn Dr. Flint on to, it's, it's coincidental, I guess, or maybe not, maybe all cosmic, that uh, it's about 100 years ago, Bureau of Reclamation and Soil Conservation Service were actively working from La Cienega all the way down to Pena Blanca, uh, installing and improving improving existing uh, waterworks in way of acequias and domestic storage and, and all this. Um, of course, Santa Fe Railroad was also diverting water from the Santa Fe River down to the town of Domingo for the, the watering station of the locomotives, you know. But uh, <clears throat> so that's important. Those documents exist. Um, I've, I've had some FOIAs open with them and had a a hard time getting a hold of much, but I think maybe a, a dedicated academic would have more success in being able to track that stuff down. So it exists and and uh, should be looked at so we don't do too much reinvention of a wheel, but maybe some improvement on one that rolls better, no? Yeah, that's super important information for that report, for that process, absolutely, thank you. So let's go on to the second agenda item, which is the uh, Rio Grande Santa Fe River connection. And the purpose of this is um, our hope that the, we can demonstrate that water actually going into the, re, the Santa Fe River reaches the Rio Grande and therefore would qualify for return flow credits and allow the city maybe to add a little water into the system. So I called um, someone I really, really like, Stacy Timmons with the Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources down in Socorro and had a uh, good long talk about this because they have done some preliminary and I'm not sure what the study was about, but they have found out that water in Pena Blanca, uh, water in the river has come from, some of it has come from the Santa Fe River. So then we get into to what a study would look like. Um, and it is not simple. Um, one of the factors is just the dam. The dams uh, affected the uh, flow to some degree. Um, and so then we started talking about what it would take. Uh, it's gonna cost money. She estimated probably $100,000 to do 
uh, a study that would be able to be documented and, and support the contention that that the Santa Fe uh, water gets into the Rio Grande. Um, and it would include test wells. And the test wells have to be on Cochiti. I mean, that's part of the part of the, the challenge will be is to get them involved and willing uh, be willing to put uh, test wells on their um, on their land. Um, go ahead, Anna. You're, you're, mute, on mute. you're mute. You're uh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, um, I, I agree with everything that you're saying, but I want to give you a little uh, information about what happened with the water release. And since I'm going to have to leave pretty soon, yeah. um, I, wa I want you because this has to do with Cochiti. So since I sit on the um, City of Santa Fe River Commission on January 14th, I found out about the release. It was the first time that I had heard about the release from the Rio Grande Compact. And it was also, um, I forwarded the um, information to the county manager and it was the first time that she had heard about it. Although maybe John Dupuy had known and maybe uh, staff had known, we did not know. So the next, um, I started, communicating with Jesse about this and trying to find out what was going on. He asked if I had any connections with Cochiti and I do know Jason and I have communicated with him in the past. And I, um, but the one thing that I saw that was the huge problem and it could be a problem for us also is the manner in which the letters were written and um, the contact, there was no request for consultation and um, there, they weren't written on letterhead. And um, it was, um, it was an inappropriate way to contact the Pueblo. So that was the first thing that I noticed when I saw their letter and, um, and then I asked for a copy of the compact letter which had been sent earlier, I don't remember. I have to look, I don't have it printed out in front of me. So um, once Jesse, as a river commissioner and as a county commissioner asked if I had any um, contact, I did contact Jason, but I did also express that, you know, I felt that consultation needed to be requested because and, and at that moment, uh, my timing happened to be excellent. Um, uh, not that it always is, but I was grateful when I did call Jason, not only was the Lieutenant Governor with him, but then the Governor of Cochiti was also on the phone call. So I, I had an opportunity to explain to them that the county did not also, at least the leadership, like myself and Catherine did not know about this release either. And I know that maybe staff knew, but it had not kind of percolated up to us. Um, and so I found out as a river commissioner for the city. Um, and, you know, I called and I felt like it was a good phone call with uh, Jason and the governor. And it, I was, I tried to be as respectful as possible because I realized that the city had made a mistake in the way that they reached out. And um, I think as even though we are not a government agency, the traditional collaboratives, I think we have to be really respectful of how we engage. And it is not, um, and then when consultation did happen, um, you know, uh, the county wasn't even uh, to the meeting, the county leadership was not invited and the mayor didn't stay there for the entire meeting. And that is another insult to the Pueblos because from what I have learned about dealing with the Pueblos is that they like to deal with elected officials. And they, that's how they, they believe they are a government elected official and they want to deal with elected officials. And so when they did have the meeting, they invited uh, Tasuki, uh, San 
um, Santa Domingo and um, Cochiti. Um, I know that meeting did not go too well, but, um, or, you know, didn't turn out the way we maybe would have liked. I, I was really hoping for a release because I felt like it would have been really good for the entire river, um, even if it was just a straight release down, uh, especially considering how dry it is. But I did not really have uh, anything to say or do about that. I only made this initial contact and explained to the Pueblos that the county had really not also been, or at least you know, the county leadership had really not been up to date. So I think that uh, whenever we do think about uh, engaging with the Pueblos, that we have to be really uh, respectful and careful and recognize that they want to hear from elected officials. That is um, how they want to operate. And uh, they, were, they were grateful that I called them. Um, I have not had a chance. Uh, um, to call Jason back again since then. It is on my list of many things that I'm trying to take care of, but um, I would have, you know, I'm, I'm not a, an expert either on dealing with the Pueblos. I'm, I'm not putting myself in that position, but I do know from my experience on dealing with the road settlement agreement and the Amet water right, some of the procedures that like they respect and want that kind of respect and like to happen. So um, yeah. I'm just Thank you, Anna. Thanks. giving you my. Yeah. That was good. All right, and that's really a, a, an excellent point. And there's no question that, that the whole process could have been handled differently. It might be really good to look back on this and go, okay, next time this comes up, this is how, this is, these are the steps that we take and ensure that the Pueblos, and it's not just Cochiti, it's also Tusuki and San Domingo and a couple other Pueblos that have uh, sacred sites along the river that, that all need to be involved. Uh, so thank you very much, Commissioner Hansen, on that information. But I do feel um, there is an opportunity to work with Jason and the folks at Cochiti. But getting back to the connection of, of the Santa Fe River and the, and the Rio Grande, one of the issues will be how much water actually gets from the Santa Fe to the Rio Grande and how quickly, that's one of the things that, that uh, Stacy Timmons brought up is how quickly that water moves. Because once it goes underground, see that it goes to subterranean after La Bajada, correct, Darren? Yes. So it goes subterranean and then it mixes with other waters. And so it gets a little, it gets complicated in determining their, their relationship. Go ahead, Darren. There's a couple, three things to, to keep in mind here. One is that <clears throat> where, yes, there is a natural confluence of the Santa Fe waters and the Rio Grande waters, it is, like you say, subterranean after La Guajara. There, there used to be another 135 acres of irrigable uh, common grant land just south of the present day, or I'm sorry, southwest of the present day village um, that is still river basin. Okay, but had another improved Azteca all along it with a Vesagua that went back into the river. That extended the natural flow at that time. But what you're looking at now is keep in mind, La Bajada and, and uh, uh, Peña Blanca sit on the opposite side of a fault. If you remember Dr. Hawley's work from uh, the early, the turn of the 21st century here, maybe 2001 or two, when he had done uh, new surveys distinguishing the, the fault lines here between the three different aquifers, for instance, ours being different than the next one uh, just up to the north in La Cienega. The other thing you got to keep in mind is that up until probably 1978, 1979, maybe later than that, I think 83 was the last time that Cochiti was actually uh, held its design uh, water quantity back, which uh, inundated all these lands that I was just talking about that were condemned by the Ar Army Corps of Engineers in the late 60s. So if you would consider the, if you wanted to look back into a justification for um, that confluence being, uh, a, if nothing else, a result of human intervention since the 1960s, okay, you could very easily justify the confluence of those waters. It does happen in a subterranean way, 
but um, really the, the missing piece of the puzzle is that Cochiti does not, the dam does not hold as much water as it was designed to hold because it turns out it could not and resulted in a rise in the water table on Cochiti farmlands lying south of the dam, which is what later led to the Santa Cruz Spring tract restoration by Bill Richardson and company and the kind of situation we're in right now. But, but that, that's what's key. If we want an easy reference to look back to and, and see that confluence in more clear cut terms without too much subterranean hydrology, which does exist, okay, but that's where, where you have to start looking is the, is the post 1976, you know, images of how this, the rest of this watershed was supposed to shape up as it turned into, uh, you know, backfeed into the Rio Grande. That's including the spillway, including all that. Then you have to look at what's being done with the gravel pits between this section of the Santa Fe River and that confluence bosque down there uh, at the junction of Highway 22 and Highway 16. Okay, right. so that I think remains to be determined, and that needs to be only disclosed by Coach T. Who else can tell you is what's going on there, and what effect is that having on either aquifer or riverbed or what? Because there's you know a, a harvestable resource being taken from from that very area. I think maybe now because, oh, well, the spillway is not going to go that far. We're not going to retain that much water. But so that's a just kind of a fun fact is that Cochiti is not holding as much water as it should, the dam. And so um, that plan kind of remained half-baked. But yes, the water eventually makes it into, I guess, test wells would find it um, if that's what we were looking for. You know, it used to be when I was a kid, there was seasonal flow. To where it was actually above ground for part of the year you know and then we'd go back uh, back under the sand it's not far underground you could dig for it you know and find it there in the arroyos billy you have something to say thank you Darren. yeah um just wanted to invite the group this evening if uh if folks want more information on the rio grande compact and the implications to the release jesse roach will be providing City Council tonight, an informational item on the topic. So please join in. Um, cool. sorry, Bill, sorry. Actually, he presented last night at City Council, but I think that meeting is recorded and you can access it on the city's YouTube page. Um, but that was last night. Oh, thank you, Christine. Sorry, Bill. Yeah, no problem. I'm actually uh, going to invite Stacy Timmons to our next meeting so maybe we can get her to give us more, more information and better information than I'm able to provide. Um, now, the next topic is our downstream user Asakia group. Go ahead, uh, David. Yeah. Yeah, just apropos of the uh, spillway at Cochiti. Um, I, when I, long ago, 10 years ago, I spoke to Jacob Pecos when he was the uh, water resources guy at Cochiti and asked if there was any interest in Cochiti in, in putting in a, a hole in the, in the spillway to <laughs> allow water to actually flow, surface water to flow through. And, and at the time he said, no, they're not interested in that because they have development on the, the downstream edge of the, of the spillway, uh, fish farm, and he didn't mention the gravel pits, but, but I brought it up because the um, Rotary Foundation had had suggested that that could be something fundable for Rotary International because the Rio Grande is an international river. And once the Santa Fe River goes into the Rio Grande, the Santa Fe becomes an international connector. And then there is international Rotary money for projects that you know could make a difference. Um, I have no idea what it would cost, but it, it uh, has has that come up with anybody's knowledge here about uh, as as a possibility? Because intuitively, to me anyway, it makes a lot of sense to uh, add a to add surface flow to the mix of of management options. I think our best resource for finding out what a bigger Cochiti water plan is is an outfit called High Watermark LLC which is uh, um, the, uh, an environmental, I guess, 
a restoration and cleanup outfit that is, uh, you know, woman owned, Pueblo owned, and and by a local lady here, uh, Phoebe Suina. So so uh, um, really, she would probably have her finger on the pulse of what the the bigger perspective is, maybe longer term instead of administration to administration, but what the longer term Cochiti to perspective would be on on management of these. Uh, again, remember when Jacob Pecos was in charge of that, I think the environment department was still called that, or maybe environmental resource protection or conservation. Sometimes that ch title changes a little bit. But um, that's ki kind of the idea, starting from from uh, uh, a leftover BLM, you know, mine restoration cleanup project further upriver from the village here, all the way down to, yes, the fishery still very active and a resource of the Santa Fe Indian School as well. Um, and that's where Kaiti comes in. He's been the wildlife biologist in connection there and doing studies further up the river from there. Um, that's further away from the, the pits are further up uh, as Highway 16 into the Llano, into some of the Arroyo system feeding into there. Uh, but so there has been an interest in that, but I don't think we get but a, a maybe a myopic snapshot any time that, that we see representation that they're collaborative so far. So I think it's maybe that we're not, uh, like maybe uh, uh, Commissioner Hansen says, it's knocking on the right door or just you know talking to the right people. And yes, there is a level of, of uh, equanimity, a level of, of peer respect that needs to be exercised on that level, which is why, yeah. I, don't, which is why I personally don't walk around trying to talk to the governor, why I personally have a more boots on the ground relationship with tribal officials like Jason or Kaiti or church officials or what have you. What, what Jacob did say they would be interested in is something about the, the Cochiti Dam itself. And right. he, he didn't use the word decommissioning, but that's right. my word. Um, and I think, you know, if you project out 100 years, 150 years, it's going to be decommissioned at some point. Yay. I, <laughs> Like, likely so until, until and then where's all that plutonium gonna go that's sitting at the <laughs> bottom of Cochiti? right downstream that mayor get, martin you, chavez does not believe exists well let's get back is, back but the next agenda item is a downstream users group and this is something that william's idea so william would you tell us what your thoughts are You're on mute. Uh, um, well, um, we this kind of talked a little bit about it. Uh, Andy, Andy brought up uh, his grant. And so Andy and I had talked. And, uh, you know, he is trying to get as many participants as possible. And I thought that uh, maybe if we had a, a lower Santa Fe River uh, Sekia committee that uh, those people would want to participate more readily, um, you know, just the strength and numbers kind of appeal uh, that it would have. And so we've had, uh, you know, pretty much uh, uh, most of the Sekias have, have uh, uh, you know, responded and you know, I guess if, if the group can sanction it now, um, you know, we'll, we'll continue working that way. I don't know. I really think it's a good idea. The one thing I want to do though is once you mention Asakia, some of those downstream users aren't on, Yeah. they don't have Asakia associations, I guess is what I'm saying. They use Asakias, but they're not associations. It's like the the Rael property in El Canyon. There's you have to have at least I think three members to be able to form an Asakia association. There's only two there. Then you've that's got under, uh, that's Trace under Rios chapter, Ranch. That's under Chapter seventy three. But if they're up there in Santa Fe County, it's a special district even outside of Chapter seventy three. So if they wanted to form themselves according to their own bylaws, they could do it. That's possible in Santa Fe County. They don't have they don't have to qualify as a special district as you do in other counties of the state. There's an exception for Santa Fe County, so that's one possibility. The other is if they hold those rights as you know uh, not severed from their land uh, in the name of but by legal transfer of instrument 
if the chain of title of the water right follows the land, then they're in, still under protection as an acequia, huh? by, by definition under the statute. So um, it's important to recognize those, those rights. And it's important to, to uh, recognize that while they may not have the standing of, of what we're considering under the New Mexico statutes, okay, of being a special district as an acequia, they're still practitioners of the acequia way of life. They're still using that water to beneficial use under state law, right? And then within the county, under their, their practice as uh, parciantes in acequia, whether there's two of them or, or three of them or whatever. That would, help. <clears throat> that would cover Trace Rios Ranch then too. Right. That's one of the stops on the tour when we get tours going again. So um, anyway, so I think it's a great idea, William. So let's let's continue. Uh, is there any opposition? The the concept of a downstream Asakia Asakia group, um, Darren, does it, does it? It wouldn't cover the the water uh, near mutual domestic in La Baja, that would it? Why not? That's what I'm asking. Okay. I just want to make no, sure we don't exclude the, anybody. Well, look, the Guadalajara <clears throat> may or may not be unique. I think it is among the, the Santa Fe River traditional communities in that our domestic water is surface water too. Right. So we have some, some infeed of other springs, like I say, on the different side of the fault than you're on. But we have uh, some infeed from those springs, geez, not as many of them as there used to be, but even from Sanaga coming on the way down. But by the time it gets to our infiltration gallery, our domestic water is being harvested from the river too. That's a surface right. So that, yes, our mutual domestic is based on a surface right in the Santa Fe River as well. Okay. So William, let's, let's proceed with this and, and uh, give it all the support we can to make it happen. So thank you for coming up with the idea. Thank you, uh, Andy, as well, for, for supporting it. Um, next one is the cultural uh, relationship of the river to people who live on it. And this actually came out of a conversation I had with some of our local Asakia members uh, last week. And we sat around and we were talking about what happens when the older uh, generation, this generation, um, passes. Who's going to take over? And the thing that came out was the importance, and I think this is something we've talked about earlier, is the educational aspect. Uh, getting people in La Cienega, I'll use that as an example. Uh, we have a influx, of, a huge influx of, of people coming in the community that have no understanding of the historical significance of this community and its relationship to water. And that just got me to thinking in terms of the river, uh, in terms of the villages on the river, uh, the pueblos on the river. And I think there needs to be um, a concerted effort to, to do a better job of educating the general population. I know we did the, the um, newspaper articles a little over a year ago, um, but that wasn't specific to the, the, to the history. It was more kind of a number of different topics. And I'm just, this one of the things uh, I have been asked by actually by Commissioner Garcia, um, Rudy, to uh, start putting together a little history of La Cienega so that we could share with people as they uh, share with people in, in the community so they have a, a, a real clear understanding of this incredible history. Um, I mean, it, it, and it's, it's one of those things I think we talked about before. Thank you, Aunt Commissioner Hansen. Thank you very much for being here today. Appreciate it. I, I thank you. I'm uh, I'm sorry. I have to leave. I, I need to go see a chiropractor. So uh, understandable. <laughs> um, I apologize, um, but thank you everybody for everything that you do, and uh, let's just keep moving forward. All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. <clears throat> but there really is this, this underlying um, feeling of downstream users that. Once you get to the wastewater treatment plant, the, the river ends for the people in the city. They don't understand that it goes beyond what it does beyond the city. And so there's things like the number of acres that are under cultivation, the number of, of, of water you know, rights, the, um, the villages, all those things I think are kind of foreign or, or unknown to people 
And I think maybe this is the role that we can play. Bobby? So this is a perfect place for, um, for uh, I've, I've been, I would love for us to have a website. And on that website, there would be, uh, we would have gathered stories from the various different communities. Um, and the website would be for the whole river, but with an emphasis on, on um, you know, so you could mouse over La Cienega and you could go to um, and listen to people's stories about, uh, you know, like um, Kieran and Carol have this amazing, had this amazing relationship with this incredible guy who, um, uh, you know, whose property is in Canyon or was in Canyon and the, the, the little house that's there, all of those amazing pieces of the river are, in, in, are integral to an understanding of, of how, of, of who we are now. So, um, and that should include um, images, photographs of families or, you know, or um, somebody out by the, and an acequia um, watering the field and what was grown there, what's grown now, um, you know, that is a, a huge important piece of understanding um, the, our river. And, and our community and the ecosystem and all of that. So, um, and if it's not a website, I don't think articles are gonna reach the people we need to reach. It's gotta be something that's there, um, that you know, that, that one can go to. And, and um, you know, William, William has collected incredible stories about Agua Fria. And I have no doubt that Darren's got his wealth of information about this. And you are. And so how do we put this together? And where does it go? Is it part of the watershed? Is it part of, is it just us? So that's it. Might I yeah. suggest that what we use is the, the relationships we have in front of us, particularly with Commissioner Hansen and with Rudy, and look at the for for introducing uh, people to to the very fundamentals of what we're talking about maybe that's where we we what where's las golondrinas in this conversation absolutely right? and and maybe um i guess we got to look past i mean it, it's still blowing my mind that we're here looking at each other in little film strips and all that right but <laughs> that, that's part of what's lacking is you need an interactive like bobby's saying interactive tactile something beyond even although this this website wow. is a great idea and having the stories at your fingertips is a great idea there's nothing like we all know getting out and seeing walking along the river either like you say ending up at tres rios or mm. or uh you know maybe now is what we need to look at is some is structuring something from this collaborative that's either along uh environmental hol uh, holistic relationships or the acequia perspective or historical perspective but I think Las Colondrinas is probably the, the best place we could possibly incubate that type of sensibility in people. And, and really, if we get some money flowing in there, then you've got participation by other local community members, maybe for, hey, it's your day to go down and, and uh, run the water for the tourists or whatever. Um, but, you know, uh, maybe that's the resource that we really have to look a lot harder at. I mean, it's staring us right in the face. You know, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. So, so, uh, um, maybe that's when we need to look at engaging that, opening that conversation and looking ahead and planning something out where in with their season of, of events as part of it's just, hey, how about, uh, uh, you know, admission is paid for a group of so many today. And that's what's going on in the city for that interface as we're distributing out, uh, you know, invitations to come a little further south into the community and see where the city's river ends up and what the downstream user perspective is. And then they can figure out on the way home, oh, look, this is still in action, or that used to be, or, you know, and start getting that perspective and reflect on it on, on the way back uh, from having a good visit in, in that little time capsule, no? No, I think you just added a tour stop. Uh, when we take people through La Cienega, we definitely need to stop at Colindrinas. 
um, and and just spend some time there without question. And I am a volunteer, so I've got kind of a special connection there. So, right, that you would be me. That's something that could be expanded there with with right. focus on the ASEC yeah, itself yeah. That, that serves that place. Yeah, and getting back to what Bobby was talking, Bobby was talking about Kieran and Carol who live in a, a one uh, family community called El Cañon, where the Rael Ranch, and the person she alluded to was Alando Rael, who is this absolute interesting, fascinating character. And I can't tell you how many people in this valley are, are somehow related to him. It's, it's fascinating. I mean, there's lots of connections that go back. I mean, if you talk about Jose Varela Lopez, who lives um, in La Siena, La Siena, actually, he's right next door to Kieran Carroll's. Um, he's kind of the last stop in La Siena Guia. He's a 13th generation. Uh, resident. His family's been there for 13 generations. And so that's the kind of history I think is really important that we, we do a better job of, of sharing and getting people to understand why we're interested about, why we're concerned about water issues and, and see what we can get that kind of general um, support for it. So, um, and the last thing I think we've already talked about is the river release. I think the river release uh, it's one of those things that, that I think going forward, we just did a, a better process, a, a better understanding, uh, a better way of communicating it. Um, I mean, those are kind of simplistic responses, but I think that makes a difference. Darren? I think we really want to jump in here and get a hold of this thing now and not just rely on, on it being communicated to us later on, but get actively involved in the scheduling of how this is going to go on in the future it, it escapes me that there there's not some alternative there that through hammering out the compact or the specific clauses in the compact we can't find a way to to um, properly manage that water through this stream bed and and get it to do what we want it to do but during a time when we need it for irrigation you know not like a complete waste right it, it's it, it's almost we were having this discussion. It's almost sacrilegious just to pump that water down here for, for nothing, for a paper commitment to the Texans, right? It's more, it would be far better to be to be accomplishing that goal while we were serving the needs of our traditional communities and perpetuating our, our culture and our, and our way of life, right? So um, there's a way we can do that, I think, if we commit ourselves to it and we get the the uh, uh, wordsmiths and, and lawyers there in Santa Fe to hammer it out to our advantage. I think we can do that. And we should take advantage of it being a topic of conversation now to keep that conversation alive until we get the right people on it to hammer that out, to make it make sense. No, it should make sense is all. Right, good idea. Okay guys, anything else today? William. Um, well, going back to the cultural thing, um, you know, we worked with the, uh, the Santa Fe um, uh, Water History Museum and also the historic Santa Fe Foundation. And what we were going to do is uh, put a, put a um, uh, like QR codes on the back of some of our signs, especially along the Santa Fe Greenway, the, the river trail, so that people just kind of walking could maybe even get an oral history read to them or, or whatever the case is. And we could actually probably do that all the way down the river. And all you would need is this maybe a, a small delineator sign. And, you know, if it's got the QR code on it, you know, it'll take you to anywhere on the internet. Great idea. An education as you walk along. Carl, one, one topic that didn't come up today is what is the general thinking with respect to the beavers? I mean, I'm hearing the need to sustain a, a continuous flowing river to maintain deliveries to acequias and sustain cultural uses of water. And we're not recognizing the fact, at least in my perspective, that the beavers are impeding that uh, mission. Oh, absolutely. Oh, but we are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's one of those things where, where uh, if you, 
if you look at that wetlands that's right below the wastewater treatment plant, uh, that project um, has created a beaver habitat. Um, and our mind from the community perspective is that that area is supposed to have a management plan. The city is supposed to have a management plan for that area, which has never happened. Um, I think we've done the research and it got stuck politically many, many years ago and never got anywhere. So that really has to have an active plan. And that becomes part of that has to be a beaver management plan. And as I said earlier, the county did have uh, some beaver deceivers, uh, which um, mimic the flow of, it, it just, it, it fools the beavers and they don't go building dams everywhere and it still allows the water to flow. And so those are some of the things, there are things that can be done. Now, the other thing can be done is to relocate beaver and that, I don't know how difficult that is. There's been, um, in the past, you had to have an area um, that could accept the beaver and you had to in, you had to inform everybody within a five mile radius that, that you were gonna bring beaver into that area. So it became very complicated and involved, but certainly it's something we can talk to Game and Fish about. Go ahead, Darren. <clears throat> this is where another opportunity comes in where we need the input of, of uh, uh, Coach T to find out the scale of their fishery and, the, and what they wanna do with natural means of retaining water from the confluence there as it comes back out from you know the sands and the and the uh, uh, gravel table right so um, that's been talked about just in loose conversation before is look they're of beneficial use down here past the secas uh, what if we had a live transport agreement and then all your rules about consent and five mile radii are off the table because you're dealing with a sovereign nation and not under state game and fish law right so i mean there's a possibility that exists that's a conversation that needs to be had the question is is it kite or is it jason or who exactly is it that's involved in managing that aspect of it but there's a possibility there as far as this gets back to what i brought up in passing when we were talking with andy and david is is the roles of of uh environmental uh NGOs, for lack of a better description, right, getting involved with this and having both funding and, and resources to, to uh, you know, perform human intervention that has this type of negative uh, uh, side effect. So where they've, remember, this collaborative was put together to, to figure out a, a specifically a plan for dealing with that impounded water and, and the, the lack of flow throughout the rest of the river. So we've, I don't think all for the worse, we've diverted our attention, we've applied our, our energy in other directions. I think all very good ones for the uh, holistic benefit of the Santa Fe River as a whole. But yeah, we need to revisit some of these perspectives and how they Absolutely. work together instead of kind of, uh, you can't ignore that one. You can't right. ignore that one. It's a, nope. it is the thorn <laughs> in our, it's the stone in our shoe, no? So, um, that's, uh, uh, we have to figure out a way to manage it. And I, I have a hard time believing there's not a sustainable way to, to manage it. That's, that's a benefit to the environment, to all the communities involved, um, you know, and to the animals themselves. They're not, that population is not healthy. Okay, Bobby. I'm gonna say something that's not gonna go over well with some of you, which is that, um, oh, human beings are not the, um, are not the sole recipient of the water in the Santa Fe River or in any river. And, um, and we have to, um, you know, and we are the ones who are the problem. Um, we are the ones who are the biggest problem. We're putting in more wells, we're using more water for, you know, I don't know, there's no swimming pools, but it came, the first thing that came to mind, um, golf, golf courses. courses. Yeah. Why do we have golf courses in New Mexico? I don't understand that. However, that is something that is a problem that I see. Um, so we're the problem. When we fix us, then we can fix the, the, the river, you know, and deal with the with what the issues are, with getting more flow, with having, you know, whatever it is that 
you know, we all want, but we want to, we do want to have a, um, we do want to have a living river and we need to fix ourselves. It's really the beavers are not the biggest problem. We are. Let me make a quick Sorry. connection, a connection with, with the museum discussion and what Bobby just said about fixing ourselves. I think that a, a museum kind of initiative, a water museum, um, is, is a great kind of container for dialogue across a lot of, of different kinds of interest groups that can, that can really be a good adjunct to any kind of regional planning that we do. And I, I posted on the chat box a link to the International Water Museum Network. And water heritage is, is, a, is a big topic now. It has like a lot of UN interest, but UN doesn't have money, but it could also be a, a good grant proposal. And so there's, and there's so much here. So I, I, I really think that that's a kind of a no brainer uh, kind of safe space for discussing issues that really have a, a lot of power, like you know, the future of our, of our water and, and what, who's going to make that future happen. Um, put, it into, put it into the museum display. That's something you okay. want to take on? Yeah, I, I, I do have, I actually applied for a, a little grant uh, about two years ago for Water Museum because I'm, in, I'm involved in water heritage uh, internationally with, because it's, it's, it's easier for me to work internationally than locally on, on abstract issues about water because everybody thinks it's all about resources. But yeah, I would love to be involved in something. And there's so many museum resources in, in the Santa Fe area and in New Mexico. Uh, UNM, uh, Jose Rivera, who's a, you know, you know him, a historian. So there are just so many pieces to try to, to draw together, convene, and see what kind of, of interest comes up. But take a look at the website because they have links to really cool um, local initiatives around the world. Not a lot of them, but it, it's uh, pretty inspiring. Anything else today, folks? William, you're, you're saying bye? Uh, no, well, Water History Museum, um, you know, I, yeah, I think I think it's Alan Mac Watson, and uh, and there's about three other guys that are real instrumental, but they've actually created this water history museum just above Crystal Ray, you know, just off of Canyon Road, and uh, you know the building's been remodeled. Uh, it's uh, like a 1880 power plant that was put on the river. And they had a Peloton um, diverter or something like that. And that uh, centralizes the water into a tube. And then it hits uh, like a gear. And that was generating 25 um, not kilowatts, I guess, of, of power. And they took that all the way to the plaza. Because the idea was that in order to go for statehood, they wouldn't get statehood unless they electrified the plaza. So they put a big sign up um, that said, welcome to Santa Fe. And it had a thousand <laughs> light bulbs on it. And, uh, you know, it was the most light bulbs west of the Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> now, remember when we mentioned the his historian in our group? This is what you get. Thank you, William. <laughs> I want to... I'll see if I can invite him to this group. That'd be great. Yeah. Before we leave, I'd like to ask Dr. Lindline as to what's happening with her um, grant and student that might be working on river issues. Hey there. Well, right now, <clears throat> the student is working really hard and trying to complete his coursework before he <laughs> dives deep into, into a, uh, a field project. So. That, that's kind of a little um, in suspension right now. We do have a slate of undergraduate students that are hoping for opportunities this summer on internships and projects. And as David was speaking about the Water Museum, I thought not knowing if we're gonna be open for regular business and able to get in the field, looking for remote 
oppor opportunities for remote experiences, one of my students is pretty skilled in making what they call story maps, where you work with the uh, computer mapping software and identify spots within your story and then add paragraphs and clips and pieces of information and make that available on the web. I know the kinds of ideas that Darren and William were speaking of are, and, and, and David, you know, our, our bigger long-term goals to have, have commissioners and decision makers in the field and have more of, um, yet yeah, more of that, more of that context. But to build a story map, that would be something that would be there in perpetuity for people to visit, you know, if it's developed well. <laughs> Nice. If you, yeah, if you guys are interested, I, I could pose that to this one particular student or two, and see if that's something that they could do as a as an independent study or as a as a pro, yeah as as a project with me or our um, history professor. Dr. Lindlein, right. if I might suggest you turn them on to the Historic American Engineering Records in the Library of Congress for La Wajada, okay. Sasekia, and um, domestic water system, and then we okay. should arrange some kind of visit because uh, you can, you know, a, a take an escorted walk around and see what we have. You know, this is a good time to see it, and I guess in the winter everything's kind of dead, but um, <laughs> you can still go along the the path of it and see the works, right? Um, have, get a, a look at uh, an actual, you know, ancient ditch, right? Mm. Okay. And I'll throw in that we may be able to find a spot on our website to, to host some of these things to plot them on there too. So that may be a, a natural. Well, again. Uh, great. That would be great. And um, I think it's super relevant to have it on the wet Watershed Association also website. Yeah. yeah. Um, once again, I mean, this is... Um, an incredible group of folks. And I thank you all for being here today <clears throat> uh, as we uh, address the water issues in this greater Santa Fe area. Um, but I really feel that we have opportunities before us uh, that we need to take advantage of. And we, as uh, Commissioner Hansen said, let's just keep pushing forward. Uh, I know there are times we kind of struggle and think that we haven't got accomplished much, but if you look at what we're doing, I think we've accomplished a lot. And I think this kind of communication is, is so important. And I'm really appreciative of having the Wild Earth Guardians here uh, because uh, I, we've had some issues <laughs> over the years uh, and we wanna get past that and get to a point where we can work together and, and really understand one another I mean, the whole thing about the, the uh, wetlands that was um, the, what we call an artificial wetlands that was placed before below the wastewater treatment plant uh, was it was never managed. It was just set there and it's become an eyesore. It's ugly, it it's causes issues. And we describe it as a contaminant sump because there is so much junk in there, but that's another topic for another time. But anyway, thank you all for coming today. I appreciate it immensely. David, everybody, Jennifer, Andrew, as always. But it's really good to be with you folks and, and uh, we'll see you in a couple months. So thank you very much. See ya, bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, bye. Andy. Bye.